Toward a Theory of the Imperialist State by Nikolai Bukharin. Many socialists, if one may call them such, are consciously undertaking a dizzying movement to the right. When viewed in terms of ideology, the action of these socialists, whose name is Legion, represents the logical consequence of a whole series of retreats from Marxism. Insignificant at first, such retreats snowball and soon are transformed according to the needs of governments and the abilities of the ideologists, from retreats into formal apostasy, into betrayal. The most cowardly and hypocritical conceal their flight by repeating the old phrases and the old terminology, an example being the Russian Marxist Potrasov, who spouts the slogan, struggle for patriotism. Others, German social imperialists such as Hain, appeal directly to the raison d'etat of Bismarck in the military reason of the general staff. With the passage of time, of course, our sirens all begin to sing the same tune. There is an objective logic at work here, which cannot be reversed once it is set in motion. It is in the nature of our time to raise all tactical questions to unprecedented heights of principle. Today, things must be thought through to the end. For what many once took to be academic scholasticism, gray theory, etc., has now acquired the most pressing practical, practical significance. And it is precisely for this reason that so many have decided to relearn. They were compelled to do so. Feta voluntem ducant, nolentem trahunt. To evade questions and obscure issues and become conciliatory would be the most hopeless course of all now that the abyss between the tactics and therefore the theory as well of Marxism and all shades of reformism has been demonstrated in practice. Among the general questions that have become particularly acute is the matter of social democracy's relationship to the state power. This development is explained by two closely related circumstances. In the first place, the imperialist epoch is one of intensified struggle on the part of state capitalist trusts, with the result that the question of the state's military might, its macht politik, etc., acquires enormous importance. In the second place, the same epoch also gives unprecedented significance to state power in the internal life of the peoples, the tentacles of this monster penetrating every crack and embracing every aspect of social life. It is at this very moment when state power is murdering and destroying the peoples for the sake of the business affairs of the ruling classes, when the most acute class struggle must become the slogan of the day for the proletariat of all countries, that the patriotic gentlemen are putting dots over all of the eyes. In the foreign policy, they are becoming the ardent supporters of armaments and by implication of imperialist slaughter. In domestic policy, they are emerging as the apologists of civil peace. Once they adhered to the slogan, peace for the huts and war upon the palaces. Now they have another version, peace for the palaces and war upon other people's huts. An orientation toward the class interests of the international proletariat has been replaced by an orientation toward the interests of the imperialist state. The one-time priests of freedom, the Democrats and the socialists have prost have prostrated themselves before the boots of the generals, and it is only in mockery that one can say they did not lick the feet or even the hands of the strong. Choking with emotion, they are in fact licking both the hands and the feet of the strong with equal zeal. 1. The General Theory of the State 1. The state as an organization of the ruling classes. 2. The origin of the state. 3. The state as a historical category socialist society and the state. Four, the functions of the state. Five, types of state, the imperialist state as a historical category. In the social patriotic literature of all countries, a clear reversal of the normal movement of thought can be observed. Concepts and terms that once had a quite precise meaning give way to the general phrase. At one time, a person had to know how to differentiate Today, on the contrary, people prefer to work with the most undifferentiated concepts, such as nations, peoples, the interests of the whole, etc. 
To use such general terms is both easier and, for certain purposes, more convenient. Thus, it becomes necessary to reiterate the old truths, which at one time were commonplace, in order to repel the insufferable, quasi-theoretical rubbish confronting the reading public on all sides. The question of the imperialist state must be prefaced by the question of the nature of the state in general, and that is where we shall begin. Definitions of the state are endless in number. We shall ignore all those theories that see in the state some sort of teleological or metaphysical essence, the reality of the moral idea, etc. Equally uninteresting for us are the numerous definitions given by jurists, who approach the state from the limited viewpoint of formal juridical dogma, and thus end up for the most part in a vicious circle, defining the state in terms of law and law in terms of the state. Such theories provide nothing in a way of positive knowledge, for they are devoid of a sociological foundation and hang in the air. The state can be understood only as a social phenomenon. Therefore, one must know its social nature, its social functions, its genesis. In other words, what we need is a sociological theory of the state. Marxism provides just such a, just such a theory. From the Marxist point of view, the state is nothing but the most general organization of the ruling classes. Its basic function being to preserve and expand the exploitation of the oppressed classes. The state is a relationship among people, a relationship of domination, power, and enslavement. It is true that the famous Code of Hammurabi, as early as about two and a half thousand years BC, announced the purpose of the state to be the establishment of law within the country, the elimination of wickedness and evil, in order that the strong shall not harm the weak. It is also true that this ancient lie prevails even to the rulers, or sorry, even to the present day, that all teachings concerning the purpose of the state are nothing but repetitions of this lie. State order and laws exist not for the benefit of the rulers, not in order to preserve and multiply their personal wealth, but for the benefit of the ruled. That's a quotation. The whip exists not for the benefit of the gentleman, but for the education of the slave, such as the thesis of bourgeois science in our own day. Of course, in reality, things are quite different. To the extent that the organizations of state power are constructed according to a plan and are consciously regulated, something that occurs only at a certain stage in the state's development, to the extent, in other words, that one can speak of the state's having a purpose, that purpose must be defined by the interests of the ruling classes and their interests alone. This situation is by no means contradicted by the fact that the state fulfills and has fulfilled a variety of socially useful functions. The latter is simply a necessary condition. The conditio sine qua non for the existence of state power. Thus, the socially useful activities of the state are essentially the conditions for prolonging and promoting to the utmost the exploitation of the enslaved classes of contemporary society, above all of the proletariat. In their politics, the ruling classes are guided by certain calculations, and the principle of the economy of forces prevails within the state organization as well. The state builds railways, undertakes irrigation works, erects schools, etc. Why? Because this is the only way to facilitate the further development of capitalist relations, to ensure that a greater mass of values is created and flows into the pocket of the capitalist class, to guarantee that the process of exploitation will proceed even more smoothly and quietly. The state undertakes a number of sanitary measures, comes forth as the protector of labor, factory legislation, etc. Why? Again, not because the enslaved proletarians have pretty eyes, but because it is profitable for the ruling class, under certain conditions, to take this approach. The ruling class acts either in its own direct interest, e.g. the contemporary state is interested in good soldier soldierly material, and therefore occasionally has nothing against measures that somewhat retard national degeneration, or else out of strategic considerations in the class struggle against the oppressed. In the latter case, the state power makes concessions, because otherwise the process of exploitation would not proceed so smoothly. In this case, the governing principle is still the interests of the ruling classes, which are merely hidden under a pseudonym, the interests of the nation, the people, the whole. 
and the state is still the organization of the most powerful economically dominant class, which, through the medium of the state, becomes also the politically dominant class and thus acquires new means of holding down and exploiting the oppressed class. As the most general organization of the ruling class, the state arises in the process of social differentiation. It is the product of class society. The process of class stratification in turn is mainly the product of economic development. It must be emphasized that the breakup of society into classes is by no means a consequence of naked force on the part of foreigners, as certain sociologists claim, repeating for the most part what was said by the notorious During. However radical that theory might appear to be, in reality it is both reactionary and, what is more important, false. Without going too far into a detailed criticism of such trends of thought, in view of their proximity to Marxism, we consider it necessary to say a few words. Here is how Franz Oppenheimer defines the historical state. In terms of its form and content, the historical state can be defined as follows. With respect to form, it is an institution imposed by a victorious group upon a subjugated group. Its content is the planned exploitation of the lower group by the upper group in accordance with the principle of the least political expenditure. <clears throat> Here's just a little note from uh, Bukharin. This is O's way of applying the principle of the economy of forces outside of the sphere of purely economic relations. In other words, its content is the unpaid appropriation of the greatest possible share of the labor product of the lower group with the least expenditure on the part of the other group, an appropriation designed to last for the longest possible period of time. In its origin, the state is exclusively, and by virtue of its essence, in the early stages of development, it is mainly a social institution forcefully imposed by a victorious group of people. Classes are created by political, i.e. non-economic means, as shown by historical and ethnographic reasons, and they can have been created only politically. <clears throat> According to Oppenheimer, Therefore, classes are simply the transformed groups of victors and vanquished, and are not at all the necessary offspring of economic development. In this theory of the origin of the classes, there is but one truth, that the concrete history of human society has been one of force and plunder. But that one truth far from exhausts the subject. In reality, lawful institutions, the state, and productive relations of a definite type, slavery, for instance, could appear and be maintained only where a sufficient basis was provided by the economic life of the groups involved. This basis did in fact exist. We are speaking of economic differentiation in connection with the growth of the division of labor and private property. It follows that even if there had been no invasion from without, the logic of economic development would have nonetheless led to the emergence of dominant classes and their common organization, the state. Recent history provides as illustration of such a development. We have in mind the United States of America. It is true that the embryo of North American feudalism and a landed aristocracy is frequently underestimated. Nevertheless, the evolution of capitalist relations in America would be utterly incomprehensible were one to accept Oppenheimer's view. For in this case, the process of the emergence of state power from within by way of social differentiation growing class antagonisms, etc., is perfectly clear. The apparent radicalism of such theoretical constructions is blatantly apologetic in origin. The real issue is to save the foundations of a commodity economy. The logic goes like this. Contemporary slavery arose through conquest and the establishment of property by force. A term or gwaltagentum a term put into circulation by During, in land. With monopolization of the land, there also arises the class monopoly of capital, thanks to the proletarianization of the masses, who are deprived of the main means of production. Landed, landed and capitalist property find their expression in the state, in this political instrument of oppression, which is the historical Prius in relation to the economy. Destroy pro property by force in the land, internal colonization, and then a strong peasantry will emerge, 
the army of unemployed will disappear and the profit of the capitalists will decline so far as to make it useless for them to continue their activities. Hired labor will disappear and by a perfectly painless route, society will be converted into a society of free citizens, peacefully trading with each other and selling everything in accordance with justice. The state will wither away, leaving free citizenship. Such is the liberal socialism of, Op of Oppenheimer. Of course, this is a complete and reactionary utopia, for the appearance of capitalist relations of domination does not necessarily presuppose non-economic pressure and conquests. And in order to eliminate exploitation, far more is needed than internal colonization, namely elimination of both the private and the collective property of the ruling classes, including that of the landlords, the industrialists, the finance capitalists, etc. Thus, every genuinely revolutionary theory must look to the root of things, <clears throat> not stop with an explanation of everything through conquest alone, but look instead for the final cause of changes in the so social economic structure. The state is by no means a power forced on society from without, rather it is a product of society at a certain stage of development. If one finds the constituent symbol of the state, its essence in the fact that it is the general organization of the ruling class, then it becomes perfectly clear why the state is viewed as a historical category. This was precisely the view of Marx and Engels. They never saw the state as a social organ that would be needed at every stage of development. In the same way that capital, for Marx, is not a thing, a means of production, in, in und für sich, but a social relationship finding expression in a thing. So the essence of the state is found not in its technical administrative role, but in the relationship of domination that it hides. And because the relationship of domination is based on class differentiation, with the disappearance of classes, the state also disappears. The state has, in consequence, both a historical beginning and a historical end. Even radical and revolutionary politicians, writes Marx, look for the source of evil not in the existence of the state, but in a certain form of the state, in place of which they want to stop establish another form. Engels expresses himself even more forcefully. All socialists are agreed, he writes, that the political state and with it political authority will disappear as a result of the coming social revolution. That is, that public functions will lose their political character and be transformed into the simple administrative functions of watching over the true interests of society. In anti during Engels declares that in socialist society, the state withers away. In the origins of the family, he gives the prognosis. We are now rapidly approaching a stage in the development of production at which the existence of these ruling classes not only will have ceased to be a necessity, but will become a positive hindrance to production. They will fall as inevitably as they, they arose at an earlier stage. Along with them, the state will inevitably fall. The society that organizes production on the basis of a free and equal association of producers will put the whole machinery of state where it will then belong, in the Museum of Antiquities, beside the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. The excerpts cited here are not at all fortuitous. On the contrary, they clearly express the specific uniqueness of Marxist theory, the histori the historicity of the Marxist method, which looks upon social phenomena not as eternal and unchanging categories, but as transient phenomena arising and disappearing with certain conditions of social life. This is not a question of terminology, as some writers try to demonstrate, any more than whether the savage's walking stick can be called capital is a question of terminology. For Marx, the criterion of differentiation, the logical fundamentum, divisions of social categories, was a different type of relations among people as opposed to a fetishistic distortion of superficial phenomena. Marx's task was to explain social development as a process by which different types of these relations or socioeconomic structures were replaced in accordance with laws. In an analogous manner, he approached the question of the state, seeing it as the political expression of a vast social historic economic structure or of class society. 
and just as contemporary bourgeois economics, being deeply static and anti-historical, cannot understand this specific viewpoint of Marx concerning economic categories, so bourgeois sociologists and jurists cannot understand the Marxist view of the state. The theory of Marx, writes Gumplowitz, for example, contains a new and, for the most part, correct view of the state. But continues this author, socialism makes a terrible mistake by suggesting that when the state becomes at last the genuine representative of the whole of society, as it previously claimed to be, it renders itself redundant. That is how the radical Gumplowitz talks, radical is in quotation marks. His faculty colleagues are already unable to understand Marx ex officio. Thus, the society of the future is a society without a state organization. Despite what many people say, the difference between Marxists and anarchists is not that the Marxists are statists, whereas the anarchists are anti-statists. The real difference in views of the future structure is that the socialists see a social economy resulting from the tendencies of concentration and centralization, the inevitable, the inevitable companions of development of the productive forces, whereas the economic utopia of the decentralist anarchists carries us back to pre-capitalist forms. The socialists expect the economy to become centralized and technologically perfected. The anarchists would make any economy or economic progress whatever impossible. The form of state power is retained only in the transitional moment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, a form of class domination in which the ruling class is the proletariat. With the disappearance of the proletarian dictatorship, the final form of the state's existence disappears as well. As we mentioned above, the basic function of the state organization consists of supporting and extending the process of exploitation. In this regard, two types of relations can be distinguished. Either the state organization is one of direct exploitation, in which case the state appears as a union of capitalists owning its own enterprises e.g. railways, the monopolistic production of one or another product, etc. Or, alternatively, the state organization takes part in the process of exploitation indirectly, as an auxiliary mechanism for the support and maximal extension of conditions suitable for the exploitative process. In the first case, insofar as we are speaking of productive labor, the state directly absorbs the surplus value created in its own sphere of activity, in the second case, it appropriates a portion of the surplus value created in branches of production that lie beyond the sphere of direct state control, relying on taxes and so forth. In the latter event, it is normal for the state to extract a portion not merely of the surplus value, but also of the wages, and where other categories of labor incomes exist, a portion of these as well. In concrete reality, both these patterns coexist, although the proportionate relation between them is subject to change and depends on the level of historical development that has been attained. Support for the exploitative process and its extension occur in two directions, externally, beyond the limits of the state's territory, and internally, or within these limits. The external policy of the state organization expresses the struggle to divide the surplus value being produced in a world context and the struggle for a surplus product insofar as a non-capitalist world exists. This struggle is played out among the different state organized groups of the ruling classes. The internal policy of the state organization expresses the struggle of the ruling classes for a share in the values being created or product through systematic suppression of all attempts at emancipation on the part of the oppressed classes. The spheres of state activity serve these same two purposes. The sphere of external control protects the external interests of the ruling classes. The sphere of justice supports the legal norms that bind the oppressed classes hand and foot. The so-called civil law defends the sacred principle of property. State law supports the political enslavement of the oppressed being the political form of economic domination, and the sphere of internal control, police in the broad sense of the world, in addition to its socially useful functions, whose real significance we discussed earlier, is aimed directly against the internal enemy. 
the sphere of military administration provides the decisive argument in the struggle both with other state organizations and with the rebellious people. Finally, there is a sphere of financial management or the art of acquiring state revenues for the preservation and extension of the state organization for its military apparatus in the first place. The bourgeoisie utters a secret truth through the lips of the German imperialist Delbruck. Where in the final analysis does real power lie? It lies in arms. The decisive question concerning the internal character of the state is therefore always, to whom does the army belong? But these general propositions with respect to the class character of the state do not touch upon the question of concrete historical types of state organization. Nevertheless, in creating a certain type of productive relations, economic evolution also creates the appropriate type of state organization. A feudal organization of the state, for instance, differs in general from a capitalist one. Moreover, even within the limits of capitalism, as it, ha as it passes in sequence through the phase of commercial, industrial, and eventually finance capital, important changes can be detected in the state superstructure. Our epoch, the epoch of finance capitalism, creates specific relations both within and between states. Just as it creates new relations of a sharply expressed historical character, so this new epoch also gives a new form to state power. In what follows, we shall attempt an exposition of the character of this state power. Two, the imperialist state and finance capitalism. One, reinforcing the role of state power. Two, the state in the production of products, the domain lands, forestry, state factories, state monopolies, mixed enterprises, state control and mobilization of industry. Three, the state in the process of circulation, the state in the means of circulation, railways, telegraph, telephone, underwater cables, commercial monopolies, state banks and banking concerns, the organization of credit, state loans, state control in the sphere of distribution, etc. Four, foreign economic policy in state power. Five, the decent or the centralization process within a state capitalist trust. Six, militarism and militarization of the economy, the so-called war socialism. Even the most superficial glance at socioeconomic life demonstrates the colossal growth in the economic significance of the state. In particular, this growth can be seen in the expansion of the state budget. The complicated apparatus of a modern state organization demands monstrous expenditures, which increase with shocking rapidity. Um, there's a chart filled with data that I'm not going to read. Since the 1890s, therefore, Germany has increased its budgetary expenditures by 126%, uh, France by 41%. In Great Britain and the United States, the increase since 1900 has been 37% and 44%. The budget of Italy has grown since the end of the 90s, 1890s, by 67%. And then there is Russia. Um which apparently is quite a significant growth. The state and the largest municipalities counted for approximately 20% or one fifth of all expenditures. Okay. As one aspect of imperialist policy, which in turn results from the specific structure of finance capitalism, militarism plays an enormous role in such budgetary increases. But we are not speaking simply of militarism in the narrow sense of the word. A further cause is the growing interference of the power of the state in every realm of social life, beginning with production and ending with the highest forms of ideological creativity. The pre-imperialist period was that of liberalism, which was the political expression of industrial capitalism and was characterized by non intervention on the part of state power. The formula of laissez-faire was a symbol of faith within the leading circles of the bourgeoisie who left everything to the free play of economic forces. Our own time, by contrast, is characterized by exactly the opposite tendency, the logical limit of which is state capitalism or the inclusion of absolutely everything within the sphere of state regulation. 
In order to ascertain the most general sources of this statification, we, we must keep in mind the tendencies of finance capitalist development, the organizational process which embraces more and mere branches of the national economy through the creation of combined enterprises and through the organizational role of the banks has led to the conversion of each developed national system of capitalism into a state capitalist trust. On the other hand, the process of development of the productive forces of the world economy drives these national systems into the most acute conflicts in their competitive struggle for the world market. These two basic facts of contemporary capitalist reality provide us with the key to understanding the state tendencies of contemporary finance capitalism. Why was the bourgeoisie really so individualistic in the past? Principally because the basic category of economic life was the private economic unit, which confronts all the others as a competitor. The interrelation of people, or the internal structure of the bourgeoisie as a class, was analogous to this interrelation among enterprises. As a class, the bourgeoisie came out against the proletariat, but internally, within the limits of the class itself, each member stood opposed to the other as a competitor. Homo homini lupus est. Each hoped to unseat his opponent by relying upon his own forces, the interplay between them being positive for the whole. Whole is in quotations. But it was not only separate enterprises and individual people who emerged as the bearers of individualism. The division of the ruling classes into different groups also played an, anal an analogous role. Above all, the division into a landed and an industrial bourgeoisie, followed by lesser divisions between the representatives of raw material production and manufacturers, commercial and usurer capital, etc. The epoch of finance capital puts an end to this state of affairs. Above all else, the individual private enterprise disappears as the cell of the capitalist organism and the basis of capitalist individualism. Moreover, the contradiction between different subgroups of the ruling classes also largely disappears. By collaborating with one another, almost every category of the bourgeoisie is transformed into the recipients of dividends, the category of interest becoming the general form of expression for all so-called non-labor incomes. The holy of holies for every bourgeois and landlord becomes the bank to which he and his kind are tied by a thousand threads. Thus a system of collective capitalism is created, which to a certain extent is opposed to the entire structure of capitalism in its earlier forms. The separate capitalist disappears. He becomes a oh, verband capitalist, <laughs> a member of an organization. He no longer competes, but instead cooperates with his compatriots. For the center of gravity in the competitive struggle is carried over into the world market, whereas within the country com competition dies out. Such a structure of the ruling classes is accompanied by a corresponding change in the state machine. The state power becomes the supreme organization of the finance capitalist bourgeoisie, who constitute a homogeneous group. The financial oligarchy rules the trusts. The financial oligarchy rules the country. This is simply another organization of one and the same clique. It is understandable that in these circumstances, the earlier opposition to the idea of state socialism, i.e. state capitalism, should vanish. By transferring management of the state capitalist trust to a formally independent state, we have in mind economic regulation in exchange for a guaranteed income. Finance capital changes nothing essential but it can expect certain advantages. These advantages are tied directly to the imperialist policy. We have already noticed that external competition begins to play an enormous role. The instruments of such competition are not only dumping and purely economic pressure, but also the pressure of armed force, of war in the final analysis. Hence the question of military might. Contemporary warfare differs completely from the wars of previous times. From an economic viewpoint, the issue is no longer just where to acquire the money, but one of financial in and industrial mobilization. A question of converting a peacetime economy into a war economy. In economic terms, war used to be a problem of state finances. 
but now the state is omnipotent. Thus, its operation does not appear outwardly in the form of an enterprise, and it no longer faces a financial economic problem, or a problem of money. Instead, the natural substance of the entire national economy is mobilized for war. The question of mobilizing the entire natural economic substance is one of an organization directly subordinated to the control of the state power. The more organized the state capitalist trust, the greater the intervention of state power, the larger the share of output by the state's own enterprises, and the more powerful the role of state banks, which regulate the circulation of money and credit. The more battle-worthy is this gigantic unit, and the greater are the profits expected by the fortunate citizens of the glorious fatherland. Uh, per so socialismus, Gehort zu den Mitteln der Kriegsführung. I definitely pronounced that very correctly. Socialism in an, is an instrument for the conduct of war exclaims the socialist renegade Edmund Fisher, taking the extreme form of state intervention to represent socialism. Such are the most general causes of the change of attitude among the leading representatives of bourgeois public opinion. The remaining opposition to statification comes from the ranks of commercial capital, a branch of activity whose importance is declining and whose functions become redundant given direct control by the state. The war has caused state capitalist relations of production to mature rapidly. War is accompanied not only by tremendous destruction of productive forces. In addition, it provides an extraordinary reinforcement and intensification of capitalism's imminent developmental tendencies. There is no doubt that the war has caused an entire industrial revolution and has revolutionized in this conditional, fate, or conditional sense the economic foundation destroying with colossal speed those capitalist relations that had already become outdated. Of course, many of these changes were due to the specific needs and tasks of the war and will die out as soon as the protracted superhuman massacre comes to an end. But many will also remain, for in the form of state capitalist trusts and under threat of its own destruction, capitalism must inevitably approach an epoch of one war after another. Let us begin with changes in the basic sphere of economic life, that of production. From the early epoch of capitalism and continuing right through the stage of industrial capitalism, certain rud rudimentary forms have persisted that can now be absorbed as living cells of the state economy. We have in mind the domain lands, the forest industry, and state factories. Compared with the sphere lying beyond the possessions of the state, these forms are numerically insignificant but the state forest industry is of considerable importance. There's another chart that I'm not reading. The mining industry should also be noted for here too, the state has retained a certain position. Much more important, however, are the ever multiplying attempts to establish state monopolies in the realm of production. There can be no doubt that this type of state intervention has the most brilliant future. To the general considerations we have already mentioned, another must be added having acquired particular significance during the war. We have in mind the need for an enormous increase in state revenues. The costs of the war are so enormous, including payment of state debts, interest payments on state loans, assistance to the wounded and orphans, etc. Reconstruction of the depleted military apparatus on an expanded scale, etc. That to cover them over a period of several years will require, and is already requiring, a total reconstruction of the state budget. At a minimum, the income of the warring states must be increased twofold, possibly more. The immediate problem of state finances therefore assumes colossal and unprecedented dimensions. As a rule, state revenues can be classified according to the following categories. Revenues from the state's own enterprises, e.g. the forest industry, mining, state factories, railways, etc., etc direct taxes, indirect taxes, including tariffs, and state monopolies. Revenues from the state's own enterprises are relatively small. Direct taxes are objectionable to the bourgeoisie, and an increase in, in, in indirect taxes and tariffs, which all governments practice con amour, meets with the stubborn resistance of the proletariat. Nothing remains but recourse to the introduction of state monopolies, 
over the production of a number of products. The tobacco monopoly, monopoly in the production of cigars and cigarettes, monopolies in alcoholic beverages, kerosene, matches, electrical energy, coal and iron, potassium, gas for lighting, certain metals, etc. These are the branches of production in which monopolization encounters the least difficulties and has already occurred in several states. Monopolization is also to be expected in war industry, that is the industries working for the army and the navy, building battleships, cannon, etc. Unproductive from the viewpoint of social development, this branch of production will grow in importance. Far from the ultra-imperialist idol of Kotsky, we face a period of more acute competition on the part of state capitalist trusts. The transitional form between the private capitalist enterprise, or trust, and the pure type of state enterprise is the so-called mixed enterprise. Recently, this form has begun to appear with growing frequency, and there is every likelihood that it will spread rapidly. Essentially, the state cooperates here with a private capitalist enterprise, or more often, with a capitalist organization, a trust, syndicate, cartel, etc. The merger is achieved through shareholding or participation. The state purchases a portion of the shares of the enterprise in question, the balance being held by the usual trust. Thus, the state and an entrepreneurial economic organization become co-owners of one and the same productive unit. Over the course of time, this intermediate type will understandably give way to the pure form of state enterprise. The mechanism for this process is very simple. Either the state becomes the owner of a growing portion of the shares, or else the shareholders are converted into mere recipients of a certain fixed income, being prevented from interfering directly in the production process, which is left to the control of the enlightened and appropriately trained imperialist bureaucracy. These are the basic and most established forms of state intervention in the sphere of production. There is a multiplicity of other measures that, to a greater or lesser degree, curtail the free disposal of private property. Although these measures by no means cause a loss in all cases for the aforesaid property owners, they do place production under control of the all-seeing eyes of the state. In the case of every belligerent country, those enterprises working for so-called national defense have been subjected to such control. In Germany, where the English blockade has increased the tendency towards regulation of the economy to an extreme, this control has been extended to several other production branches. If, for example, a special <laughs> Reichsverteilungsstell not only distributes the finished product, sugar, shall we say, but also determines precisely how much sugar must be produced, by what date, and where to deliver it, then, under these conditions, the arbitrariness of the private entrepreneur or syndicate gives way to state discretion. We have, in consequence, a limitation on production and sales. Occasionally, the state goes further and joins the different production groups together in a single complex for the sake of greater production planning, as was the case, for instance, in the German coal industry. Finally, there is an infinite number of rules that regulate the production process itself requiring a certain method of production, the use of specified raw materials, etc. All of these measures, to quote Professor Hatchick, convert the producer and the seller into social functionaries. The worthy professor neglects only to mention the indecent compensation these syndicated social functionaries receive. In these ways, state power absorbs virtually every branch of production. Not only does it preserve the general conditions of the exploitative process, but in addition, the state increasingly becomes a direct exploiter, organizing and directing production as a collective, joint capitalist. A similar process can be observed in the sphere of circulation. Let us begin by considering the technical material framework of the circulation process, the railways, telegraph, telephone, underwater cables, and the postal organization as a whole. Here, statification occurred earlier than in other areas. The reasons for statification of the railways were typical. Beside the economic reasons, the enormity of the capital to be advanced, the low rate of profit at the outset, etc., both fiscal and military strategic, strategic motives were operative. 
Although much later than other countries, England brought the railways under the treasury, owing to the influence of the Great War. As with protectionism, the creation of a standing army, the curtailment of individual freedoms, and so forth, the transition was also made to a state railway industry. The relative weight of state railways as a percentage of total track length is as follows. Belgium, 90.8%. Germany, 92.5%. Denmark, 55.6%. Italy, 77.8%. The Netherlands, 56.3%. Norway, 84.2%. Austria, 80.4%. European Russia, 65.5%. Switzerland, 71.9%, etc. France, Portugal, and Sweden have railways of the mixed type. As for the telegraph, only in America does the private telegraph play a major role, state telegraphs being the norm elsewhere. The cable network is mainly in the hands of private companies, but the state's share is growing. There can be no doubt that the influence of the war is very forceful in this respect in the name of national defense and so forth, an energetic policy of statification is being implemented in all of these branches. The skeleton of the circulatory process is therefore largely in the hands of the state, but the very process of circulation is itself passing more and more into state hands. Consider, for example, state trade monopolies. Generally speaking, these monopolies were introduced for the same reasons as those in the sphere of production. From a negative viewpoint, the growing collectivist character of capitalist relations. More positively, the financial and strategic considerations that compel the bourgeoisie to centralize economic relations at the level of the fatherland. In cases in which a production monopoly is difficult to establish, for one reason or another, the state assumes the exclusive right to sell the particular product and to set its own prices. There is no doubt that trade monopolies represent a step toward further intrusion of state control into the realm of production. The only difference is that in this case, intervention begins, so to speak, at the other end. The joint stock form of enterprise adds the possibility in this sphere, as well of creating mixed enterprises, whose shareholders are public law institutions, the state municipalities. On the one side, and commercial industrial organizations on the other. In time of war, a similar role is being played in Germany by the numerous war material societies, which have, completely, which have complete authority under the control of state power to centralize all available supplies of different types of goods and to dis distribute them in accordance with definite regulations established either by the state e.g. rubber, benzene, metals, leather, etc., or by imperial allocation offices, which handle the allocation of commodities throughout the empire. Numerous organizations are obliged to supply commodities, others are obliged to accept them, and prices are fixed by the state. Finally, an extreme form of state intervention is the system of confiscation, Consider, for instance, the activity of the German government in supplying the population with food products and the so-called food dictatorship. Here, too, several syndicate organizations cooperate with the organs of state and local government. As a result, the anarchic commodity market is largely replaced by organized distribution of the product, the ultimate authority again being state power. Of course, many of these forms must also die out with the advent of normal conditions for the economic process. The dreams of certain ideologists of imperialism, dreams of so-called Maja Sinirang, or the establishment of gigantic state warehouses of different kinds of products, with the, simultaneously, with the simultaneous near isolation of the state economy, in short, dreams of economic autarky are absolutely utopian, but the general tendency of growing intervention by the state remains, even though its theoretical limits are impossible to establish. If we turn now from the circulation of commodities to the circulation of money in the sphere of credit, we find the exact same process. The need for the state to regulate the entire process of monetary circulation is also made dramatically evident in time of war. 
Financial mobilization presupposes the colossal might of state central banks, which gather up virtually the entire gold supply of the country. The concrete constellation of monetary circulation depends primarily on the policy of the state bank, the quantity of notes it puts into circulation, etc. The same is true of credit relations. In Germany, the state bank has also been supported by the loan offices, which are subordinate to the bank and were specially created for the war. Besides accepting all manner of paper securities, these state institutions are also designed to grant credit, commodities being accepted as security, thus something in the nature of a mutual, a mutual guarantee or an ever-expanding community of interests arises between the state power and different circles of the bourgeoisie as the representatives of economic life. Within the same sphere, this mutual guarantee might take many different forms. The role of state loans is especially important. The success of internal loans is highly dependent on one condition, namely that capital cannot find areas for investment because the productive base has been narrowed owing to the war. Analysis of the sources of the payments makes it clear that the popular character of the success is pure fantasy. If the capitalists give up their capital to the state, they also become shareholders in the whole aggregate of the state enterprises. In the broad sense of the word, for the fixed rate of interest they receive represents a portion of the state's general revenues. The more extensive the external loan operations are, the more closely are all the branches of production tied economically to the state power. This tie originates and is accomplished in the sphere of circulation. The supreme regulator is the state bank. It is interesting that the structure of the latter institution is not the same in all countries. In some cases, there is a purely state institution, in others, an enterprise of mixed type. The German Imperial, Imperial Bank is one of a mixed nature. As a joint stock society, it is direct, directed by state officials, who are appointed by the Emperor on the advice of the Bundesrat. Bundesrat. The nature of this bank has even given rise to several theoretical discussions on the theme of whether it is a state institution, that is, whether it is an institution of a public law nature or a simple joint stock company of a private law nature. In this connection, we should also remember the so-called regulation of consumption. In fact, this sphere belongs entirely to circulation. It is a process of distributing goods, not of consuming them, for the latter lies beyond the limits of any economic investigation. We have in mind as well the numerous ration cards and other measures, cards for bread, butter, meat, etc. In certain countries, the intervention of state power has assumed enormous dimensions. In Germany, it has led to regulated distribution of all food products and to communist mass meals. Communist being in quotation marks. This type of state intervention, however, is the least stable, and there is no doubt that it will disappear with the end of the war and overcoming Germany's economic isolation. It remains for us to look at the state's foreign economic policy. Under this heading belong, first and foremost, all possible types of prohibitions and limitations on imports and exports, including the entire system of tariff policy, trade agreements, support for national industries abroad, premiums of all sorts, the search for concessions and profitable lending opportunities, etc., plus direct plunder or seizing the territory of someone else's fatherland, fatherland being in quotations, for mon monopolistic exploitation by one's own finance capital, which is the essence of an imperialist policy. Now let us summarize. In total contrast to the state in the epoch of industrial capitalism, the imperialist state is characterized by an extraordinary increase in the complexity of its functions and by an imp impetuous incursion into the economic life of society. It reveals a tendency to take over the whole productive sphere and the whole sphere of commodity circulation. Intermediate types of mixed enterprises will be replaced by pure state regulation, for in this way the centralization process can advance further. All the, mem all the members of the ruling classes, or more accurately of the ruling class, 
for finance capitalism gradually eliminates the different subgroups of the ruling classes, uniting them in a single finance capitalist clique, become shareholders or partners in a gigantic state enterprise. From being the preserver and defender of exploitation, the state is transformed into a single centralized exploiting organization that is confronted directly by the proletariat, the object of exploitation. In the same way as market prices are determined by the state, the workers are assigned a ration sufficient for, this, for the preservation of labor power. A hierarchically, a hierarchically constructed bureaucracy fulfills the organizing functions in complete accordance with the military authorities, whose significance and power steadily grow. The national economy is absorbed into the state, which is constructed in a military fashion and has at its disposal an enormous disciplined army and navy. In their struggle, the workers must confront all the might of this monstrous apparatus, for their every advance will be aimed directly against the state. The economic and the political struggle cease to be two categories, and the revolt against exploitation will signify a direct revolt against the state organization of the bourgeoisie. All of these developments lie in the near future, unless a social catastrophe occurs before the pure type of economic relations we have been describing can take shape. It is easy to qualify in socio-economic terms the mode of production whose undeveloped form is represented by the contemporary uh, Craig social lasmists, <laughs> i.e. the militarization of almost every branch of industry. Many bourgeois theorists speak of state socialism. Professor Kremen, for example, whom we have cited previously, writes, The powerful influence of all the means currently employed to support the state and defend the fatherland means that have been adopted by the state out of military considerations will be to move us much nearer to state socialism. But this change will not occur in the way which some have dreaded and for which others have hoped. This is not a loose international, but a nationally consolidated socialism that we are approaching. It is not a democratic communism. Still less is it an aristocratic class government. It is a nationalism that reconciles classes. Hmm. And the revisionist E. Fisher, in addition to claiming that socialism is essentially nothing but the carrying over of the state idea into the national economy and social life in general, tries his utmost to find socialism, referring to monopolization of the various branches of production with such strange names as electrical socialism, water socialism, and so forth. These misleading phrases obscure the reality of the matter, namely that in war socialism, class contradictions not only persist, but reach their maximum intensity. And war capitalism had quotation marks around it. In the ideal type of imperialist state, the process of exploitation is not hidden by any secondary um, forms. The mask of a superclass institution that looks after everyone alike is torn away from the state. This is the basic fact, and it is thoroughly, and it thoroughly demolishes the arguments of the renegades. For socialism is regulated production, regulated by society, not by the state. State socialism is about as useful as leaky boots. It is the elimination of class contradictions, not their intensification. On its own, the regulation of production is far from signifying socialism. It occurs in every familial economy, among every slave-owning natural economic group. What we in fact expect in the near future is state capitalism. A single protest might be raised against such a designation, namely that the logical extreme and pure type of the relations now emerging would entail the elimination of hired labor. The worker would receive rations, aliments, not a monetary equivalent of the value of labor power. Just as market prices are replaced by regulated distribution of the product, so the wage form would disappear and along with it hired labor as such. The worker would become a slave, and since hired labor represents one of the more one of the most characteristic features of capitalism, it is impossible to use the term capitalism to designate relations that involve the elimination of hired labor. Nevertheless, 
we would accept this complaint as being correct and would introduce some new designation for the type of relations now being formed only in one event, that is, if a single world economy were in existence. Insofar as this is not the case, for reasons we have discussed in Communist, a single world economy represents an impossible hope, and insofar as the anarchy of the world market remains, the categories of value and wages are also preserved, with the single difference that now the position of the separate enterprise has been taken by the state enterprise. The labor market will become the world market for labor, and the movement of workers from one state to another will gather momentum. Likewise, we must not think that the state will be able to establish whatever prices it dreams up, or that the law of labor value loses its significance. For it would be absurd to imagine a closed state and economic autarky. The pressure of the world market remains. Thus, state capitalism is the completed form of a state capitalist trust. The process of organization gradually removes the anarchy of separate components of the national economic mechanism, placing the whole of economic life under the iron heel of the militaristic state. 3. The organizational process, state power, and the working class. 1. The dialectical development of state power, mercantilism, Manchesterism, imperialism. 2. Finance capitalism and the organizational process in the life of society, the emergence of a number of bourgeois organizations. 3. The dialectical development of state power, the sole organization of the ruling classes, one of the organizations, the all-embracing organization. 4. The working class in the state. More than, more than oats develop, according to Hegel. Um, a similar historical joke is played out in connection with the state. What a dry-ass joke. <laughs> if we consider the capitalist state, we see that during the epoch of commercial capitalism, at the dawn of its development, capitalism bore the, the mark of the state on its brow. State intervention flourished both externally and within the country, including the regulation of foreign trade, a system of premiums, and every type of protectionism, the granting of privileges, etc. Such was the practice of mercantilism. The ensuing stage of capitalist development represented a complete negation of the mercantilist epoch. Industrial capitalism found its political expression in liberalism. Even the slightest intervention by state power in the natural course of economic life was considered a harmful experiment doomed to failure. So prevalent was this, was this sort of theory that Spencer, for example, saw, on, saw in the omnipot omnipotence of the state a vestige of the military regime that was not suitable for industrial capitalism with its voluntary cooperation. If liberalism and industrial capitalism were the negation of mercantilism and commercial capitalism, then imperialism, with finance capitalism as its basis, is the negation of the negation from the viewpoint of the, de of the developing functions of state power. The fact that recent tendencies of development are interpreted by some to be vestiges can be explained only by tradition, the inertia of thought, a failure to understand contemporary relations, and the projection of outmoded views from the pre-imperialist epoch into our own time. In reality, we have entered a new stage of development. With unprecedented force and on a scale never before observed in European history, the state is once again invading the sphere of economic relations. The class communism of the American Incas, etc., has not been adequately investigated. Insofar as we are speaking of society's economic life, this growth of the state became possible thanks to an organizational process which has strikingly unfolded since the final quarter of the past century. As we know, this process took the economic form of an unusually rapid growth of every possible type of entrepreneurial organization. Trusts, syndicates, cartels, corners and rings on the market. Special alliances for struggle against workers, organizations, and various institutions that undertook to represent the interests of industry and commerce. 
see, for example, the Russian councils of congresses, etc. But we must not assume that the organizational process has embraced the economy alone. Its significance is much more general and profound. One could even say with a certain legitimacy that the bourgeoisie has not left a single corner of social life completely unorganized. For spiritual cultivation of the masses, there is the church organization, with its far-flung apparatus, the school and the organized press. The daily spiritual food that is served up in abundance to the man in the street has long since ceased to be a private matter. Every conceivable organization, the telegraph agencies, the press bureaus, the various associations of journalists, and finally, entire newspaper trusts, which strictly control the production of bourgeois lies, etc., adopts the honorable function of providing support to the existing order. Science also outgrew the condition of primitive disorganization long ago. Every type of research, beginning with experiments in chemical laboratories or work on microorganisms and ending with archaeological excavations, takes place systematically and according to plan. The academies see to the organization of science, along with learned conferences, specialized publications, and an endless stream of specialized institutions of every type, libraries, museums, experimental stations, laboratories, and observatories, which are genuine scientific factories, etc. Bourgeois politics are also organized. Never before has there been such a close union of the bourgeois riffraff as there is today in the epoch of finance capitalism. All of the formerly differentiated political organizations of the ruling classes are gradually losing their differentia specifica, being transformed into a single imperialist party. All embracing blocks of all the imperialist parties, particularly when it is a question of the common struggle against revolutionary social democracy, complete unity on question, questions of foreign policy, the disappearance of all the remnants of democracy, and the former liberalism. All of these trends clearly illustrate the process. The degree to which this universal organizational process embraces all and sundry can be seen simply by listing the multitude of societies, circles, associations, and other organizations, no matter what the area. Take, for example, propaganda on behalf of colonial policy. In France, by 1906, this purpose was served by the various learned geographic societies. Uh, L'Union Coloniale, Le Comité du Plé, La Soci Société de Propagande Coloniale, La France Col Col Colonisatrice, L'Action Coloniale et Maritime, La Société des Études Coloniales et Maritimes, La Société Française de Colonis Colin Colonisation et d'agriculture coloniale. Oh, there's so many. La colonisation franchise. L'association pour le plasma gratuit de fran franger. Does that make sense? À l'étranger et aux colonies. La société française d'immigration des femmes and L'Oeuvre Coloniale des Femmes Franges. Sure. Then there were the special comité. Oh no, there's more! Le comité de l'Afrique Française, de l'Asie Française, de Madagascar, de la Guyane Française, de l'Océanie Franchise, le comité de propagande de l'Afrique Oxy Occidentale Franchise, Le Comité du Commerce et de l'Industrie de l'Indochine, La Société L'Africaine, La Réunion d'Études Algériennes, all of these together with L'Association Cotonnière Coloniale, L'Association uh, Couchoussière Coloniale, L'Alliance Française, La Mission Lec Frangaise, La Société Anti-Esclave 
fascist de France, la Croix Verte, etc., etc. In other words, a multitude of various types of bourgeois organizations emerge. We shall speak of proletarian organizations later, and they overlap one another in the most diverse realms. The separate representatives of the ruling classes take their seats in different cells, which grow within definite limits, or definite limits. Work out the collective will, impose and resolve common tasks. Finally, the requirements of imperialist development compel bourgeois society to mobilize all of its forces, to extend its organization throughout the broadest possible context. The state absorbs into itself the whole multitude of bourgeois organizations. Here too, the war provided an enormous stimulus. Philosophy and medicine, religion and ethics, chemistry and bacteriology, all were mobilized and militarized in exactly the same way as industry and finances. The more rapidly there occurred a conscious, organized adaptation to the whole, that is, the more rapidly the state, by one means or another, incorporated these countless groups into its own universal organization, the more planned was the operation of this enormous technical, economic, and ideological machine. In the press, it was announced that the capitalists had raised the question of producing nitroglycerine from the colossal number of corpses being produced by the war. All that was needed was to discover in a scientific manner the best method of doing so, a method that by virtue of the cheapness of the raw material would promise enormous profits. That's gross. We do not know how true this report is, or whether such ingenious thoughts really did enter the head of some worthy bourgeois. But the report, in the form of a caricature, it is true, does not express the real state of affairs. From the viewpoint of sober state reason, that is, from the viewpoint of the ruling finance capitalist oligarchy, the proletarian mass is an instrumentum vocale for the acquisition of super profits. And just as the worn out parts from machines or industrial experiments are utilized in some other productive process, so the energy locked up in human corpses can also be used. From this viewpoint, which is unique to the imperialist state, the work of doctors, sisters of mercy, the Red Cross, and similar organizations represents a repair job done on those instruments of imperialist competition that are worn out, but are still suitable for further use. As for the scholars who were struggling with gum diseases, typhus, and cholera, their work is that of a lubricator who applies the oil and eliminates excessive friction in an enormous, death-dealing machine. That is how it is once state power becomes the center of attraction for these organizations and converts them into subordinate organs of the state giant. The general pattern of the state's development is therefore as follows. In the beginning, the state is the sole organization of the ruling class. Then other organizations begin to spring up, their numbers multiplying, especially in the epoch of finance capitalism. The state is transformed from the sole organization of the ruling class into one of its organizations, its distinction being that it has the most general character of all such organizations. Finally, the third stage arrives, in which the state swallows up these organizations and once more becomes the sole universal organization of the ruling class, with an internal technical division of labor. The once independent organizational groupings become the divisions of a gigantic gigantic state mechanism, which pounces upon the visible and internal enemy with crushing force. Thus emerges the finished type of the contemporary imperialist robber state, the iron organization, which with its tenacious, raking claws embraces the living body of society. This is the new Leviathan, beside which the fantasy of Thomas Hobbes looks like a child's toy. For the time being, there is no force on earth that might be its equal. No et potestas superterum quae comparator, eh? I don't know what that means. Now we must turn to a perfectly natural question, the role played by the workers in proletarian organizations. Here there are two theoretical possibilities. Either the workers' organizations, like all the organizations of the bourgeoisie, grow into the general state organization and become a simple appendage of the state apparatus, 
or alternatively, they outgrow the confines of the state and explode it from within, organizing their own state power or dictatorship. The first route taken by the yellow social dem democracy of the Gestis, Plekhanovs, Scheidemans, Hendersons, Brantings, and company is one of converting the revolutionary party of the proletariat into a subordinate mechanism of the imperialist state, into its labor department. The second route, that of Libnik, Hogland, McLean, Moronov, and other comrades, is the route of revolutionary social democracy. In the mass actions of the proletariat and the struggle between different streams and the splits in the old social democracy, we are experiencing a general revolutionizing process. This process indicates that the second outcome is becoming increasingly probable and that the national imperialist labor policy will be overcome by the international socialist revolution. The material basis for such an outcome is the differentiated influence of imperialist policy on the position of the bourgeoisie compared with that of the proletariat. So long as imperialism allowed only its progressive side to be seen, the peaceful expansion of war of pre-war times, imperialist attitudes necessarily grew up within the proletariat. But now imperialism has displayed its aggressive side, and the more it does so, the greater is the burden it imposes on the international proletariat. Whereas the imperialist bourgeoisie sees vital necessity in continuation of the imperialist policy, the proletariat sees an equal necessity in the destruction of imperialism and of capitalist production along with it. Any further development of the state organisms before the socialist revolution is possible only in the form of militaristic state capitalism. Centralization is becoming the centralization of a barracks. In the upper stratum of society, a vile military clique is inevitably growing in strength, resulting in brutal drilling and bloody repression of the proletariat. On the other hand, we have already seen that any activity by the proletariat under these conditions is inevitably directed against state power, hence a definite tactical demand. Social democracy must forcefully underline its hostility in principle to state power. So far as parliaments are concerned, social democracy must vote against the introduction of all monopolies, all customs, unions, etc. Certain adherents of the party center attempt in vain to demonstrate that such innovations signify economic regression. But that is not the reason for our tactic. On the contrary, from an isolated economic and nationally limited point of view, these forms involve further centralization and undoubted progress. The real point is that this progress is nothing more than reinforcement and support for militarism and imperialism. To support the contemporary state means to support militarism. In our day, the historical task is not to worry about further development of the productive forces. They are perfectly adequate for the realization of socialism, but to prepare a universal attack upon the ruling gangsters. In the growing revolutionary struggle, the proletariat destroys the state organization of the bourgeoisie, takes over its material framework, and creates its own temporary organization of state power. Having beaten back every counterattack of the reaction and cleared the way for the free development of socialist humanity, the proletariat, in the final analysis, abolishes its own dictatorship as well, once and for all driving an Aspen stake. Um, at this point, the manuscript breaks off. The remaining sheets have been lost.